Maybe you've not been baptized yet. Maybe, uh, maybe it's something that God is prompting you to consider um, as a mark of faith and obedience to Christ. Come and talk to us if you're interested in, in exploring what that might be for you. Well, um, we are in our fourth and final part of a mini-series that we've been uh, looking at since Easter called Where is Jesus Now? And the reason why, we're, why we've been looking at this is because we're thinking, hold on, we've had Easter Sunday and we celebrate the resurrection. And of course we look forward as Christians to Jesus' return, but what is Jesus doing in the meantime? Where is he? What's he up to? And there are some startling things that we've been looking at over the last few weeks and concluding with today that I hope and pray will really magnify your view of, of Jesus, what he's, what he's doing, and, uh, and, and, and really the glory of Christ and, and the impact on our own lives. Here are the things that we've focused on. The fact that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, his salvation work is complete, that he sits on high, enthroned in heaven, ruling over all things. Jesus is with us by his Spirit. He may be at the right hand of the Father, but he's also, he promised to be with us by his Spirit, always at work amongst the lives of every single Christian around the world, making us more like Jesus, more holy and uh, more like Christ uh, day by day. Jesus is interceding for us to God at the right hand of the Father. He's praying to God for you, that Jesus is cares about every day in your life. He loves you so much and wants good for you. He's talking to the Father about every good thing that God might do in your life. Can you imagine that? that? Jesus isn't just sitting waiting, but he's actively working for your good. And today is our final one, that Jesus is preparing a place in heaven for us. So let's pray for a moment and just prepare our hearts for what God might say to us today. Father, we thank you that you are an active God. We thank you that you're not a God who just acts at certain points in history and then leaves us to work out life on our own. No, we thank you that you are present and active and doing good and preparing us for the future. And everything that is best for us is your concern. We thank you that Jesus is... Um, is doing things that perhaps we don't even really consider or imagine. And I pray that even today we might have an expanded view of your greatness, but also of your goodness. So we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now take your Bibles then and turn to John chapter 14. We're just going to read uh, verses 1 to 7 together. And uh, yeah, keep, keep, your, keep your Bible open for the message. Uh, I'm just going to have the words for this up on the screen for now, but they won't remain there throughout. So Jesus talking with his disciples. He says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be, with, may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. That's what we're going to base our, base our message on and some other verses as well. So keep, keep, your, keep your Bible open there. Now, if I was to ask you the question, where would you most like to be right now? I wonder what your instinctive uh, answer would be. Maybe you don't want to say out loud because really what you want to say is, oh, I'd really want to be right here. I'm happy, most happy right here, right now. Um, and actually, for, for many of us here, you know, anticipating Seth's baptism today and really enjoying it, you might actually say, no, I am happy right here, right now. 
But actually, a lot of the time in our lives, we would so much rather be somewhere else than the place where we are. We're just thinking of some, somewhere else to be, maybe somewhere more exciting, or maybe with people that we'd rather be with. It's classic, isn't it, now? People talk to others on their phones with others present in the room. We're all guilty of it. It's almost like we'd rather be somewhere else than right here. Um, you know, it might be that you're dreaming of the perfect holiday. We often fantasize about, you know, somewhere exciting or relaxing that we'd rather be. Or maybe you're just really tired today, and if you were given the opportunity, you'd, you'd rather just be back in bed sleeping. Oh, a bit of a reaction there. Maybe that's a few of you. There you go. I've, I've struck a nerve. Well, two weeks ago, when we, uh, we saw in the prayer that Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, Jesus prayed about the place where he would most love each of us to be. Remember these words? This is part of his prayer. Jesus prayed. He said, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. So Jesus was in the upstairs room of the house of a friend and um, is with his disciples, preparing them for his impending death on the cross. Uh, he was preparing them for his rising, also for his ascension and the sending of the Holy Spirit. And this whole section of John chapters 13 to 17 ends with the whole of chapter 17 being a prayer that Jesus prayed. And he prayed for all future believers. He prayed for himself, he prayed for his disciples, but he prayed for all those who would believe after that time, including us. So it's wonderful to see a prayer that Jesus prayed for us. Some of the things that he prayed then were, were, seem to be so important to him that we can presume that he's also praying those things for us now. If Jesus is interceding, being the go-between between us and the Father, then surely he's praying these things now. What did he pray? He prayed that the church... Christians would be unified so that we would reflect the unity of Father, Son, and Spirit, the closeness of relationship. God, Jesus wants that for us as the church, closeness of relationship and unity. He prayed that our unity around the truth of God would enable our witness to the world to draw people to God. So how united church is around the truth is key to our outreach. You can't just put on a program no, it's about a reflection about who we are as the people God making us to be. But Jesus also prayed that all believers would one day be with him fully, fully with him and perfectly with him. He wants us to be with him. That's his prayer. But why is that such a priority for Jesus? What is thrilling about us being with Jesus? Well, let's expand the prayer request that Jesus made. This is more of what he said. He said, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Jesus' purpose is that we might be with him to see his glory. Glory is seeing the very best of someone, the the, the awesomeness of Jesus, the majesty, the worth of Jesus. He wants us to be blessed by his glory. When Jesus prayed that whole prayer in chapter 17, it was the night before he was going to go to the cross. And as Jesus prayed to the Father, he, he said, Father, the hour has come. Give glory to your Son so that your Son may glorify you. So when Jesus was praying to the Father, he was saying, Father, I know that there's glory in the cross. That my death on the cross is victory. It's going to show the world and demonstrate to the world the love of God and the power of God over sin and death. My death is going to bring life for others. He carried on in his prayer and said, uh, Father, I've brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world began. So Jesus was saying, yeah, there's glory in the cross and glory in the resurrection, but there's also the glory that is there when I am with you in your presence as I have been for eternity. So we can see that glory is about um, the amazing um, majesty and weightiness of who Jesus is. And you know that picture in Revelation chapter 5 of Jesus depicted as the Lamb of God 
Lots of people have tried to draw pictures. It's so hard, isn't it, to, to really put it all together. But Jesus is the Lamb of God being worshipped in the throne room of heaven by all believers and by all creation. It's like everything comes together and says, this Lamb, this Jesus who was slain and who rose, is the one who is worthy of our praise and worship. So when Jesus prayed to the Father that his desire was for us to be with him and see his glory, it's because the pinnacle, the pinnacle, the top experience of our um, purpose of life is to be with him and to see his glory. We were made to worship. And when our worship is directed at our creator, our savior, our Lord and our king, then, then we are fulfilled. Then we are fulfilled. So whilst it's not wrong to have a nice holiday and to plan it and look forward to it, uh, whilst it's not wrong to get some extra Zs if you're particularly tired, the truth is, that no experience in this world will ultimately fulfill us. Nothing will satisfy us in this world because everything falls short of what we were made for and where we are most um, uh, meant to be and where we are destined to be if we are Christians. C.S. Lewis put it in this way. C.S. Lewis said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, then the most probable explanation is we were made for another world. <laughs> this is not our home. And it's this that Jesus comforts his disciples with in John chapter 14, when he's preparing them um, for him leaving them. He's saying there is more, there is more, there is something better. There's something that I'm preparing for you that will be yours one day. And you see from those words from John chapter 14 how Jesus describes heaven. Now, there's lots of different ways that heaven is described in Scripture. But here, Jesus talks about it being the Father's house. The Father's house. Remember earlier when we were talking about baptism, what baptism is? Um, it, baptism is about being, uh, it's entering into a new family. We're bapt baptized into the family of God. And so, through Jesus, God becomes our Father. And so, this, this whole idea of heaven being like the Father's house, being described as the Father's house, it's, it's that image of being adopted into God's family, being saved. We're not left alone or abandoned as orphans. But God, the God who made everything, has brought us into his family as his children. And the security of being part of God's family and knowing his love and care is beyond anything. You know, even when we think about um, our own experience of, of loving families, it cannot even compare with the love that we experience from God as Father. Jesus said that my Father's house has many rooms. That however we picture it, there is room enough for all those who trust in Jesus. All are welcome and all have a place in God's home. And God doesn't need to divide up his time or his love. You know what it's like, you know, in our own households, when we feel like, am I giving enough ten attention to each one in my family? But God's love, it seems, uh, the, every new person that comes into the family, it's like God can just multiply his love. He doesn't divide it. God isn't limited in the way that we're often limited as human beings. God is infinite. And so being part of the Father's house is going to be absolutely wonderful. So Jesus is there with his disciples the night before his death. And they're distraught, they're confused. Jesus says, do not be troubled, because in their own pain and confusion of Jesus leaving them and dying on the cross, and even when he rose again, he was to leave them again, wasn't he, when he ascended to the Father. But Jesus said, I am going to prepare a place for you in the Father's house. And I will come back to take you to be with me so that you also may be with me where I am. Can you even begin to contemplate how amazing that is that Jesus right now is preparing a place for you? That Jesus is decided to spend and don't 
let's not have a debate about what does time look like, where he is right now, and what, what's going on there. Let's just work in our human terms for, for a moment. Can you even begin to think that Jesus would choose to spend his time and attention on you right now because he wants to prepare a place for you so that you might be with him where he is, in the Father's presence and, and enjoying and experiencing the glory of heaven in the Father's house. We can rush through sermons. <laughs> we can say a lot of words. There's a lot of words that I say today. That is what Jesus is doing. And if you're a Christian, if you're trusting in Jesus, Jesus is doing that for you right now. In, in, in Thomas's awkward confusion, he got a bit boggled <laughs> by what Jesus was saying. Jesus said, you know where I'm going. Thomas said, Lord, Lord, we don't know the way. So I don't know where you're going. How, how can we know the way? Yes, in, a, in our society, there are lots of people that might say, when you die, you die, and that's the end of it. But actually, there seems to be a growing... Uh, in, in our culture, even in the West, there seems to be a growing spirituality and a growing desire to know something more and, and to believe that there's something more. Many people, many people have a hunch that there is a heaven of some kind, even if they don't quite know what it is. Um, of course, as Christians, we absolutely do. But even amongst us as Christians, there's debates, aren't there, a, uh, 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 about the, the pictures and prophecies in Scripture, exactly the, about the time frames, the methods, the processes of when Jesus will return, what that's going to look like, and what's going to happen afterwards. Lots of things there, but even Thomas was confused, wasn't he, about what Jesus was saying. And Jesus' response here was simply to say, trust me, trust me. It's, it's, it's a person that is the way. He said, I I am the way, Thomas, and I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You want to know God? You want to know what God's like? Look at me, Jesus says. It's me, it's through me that is the key. I am the way for you. And Seth has declared his faith in Jesus today. He's come to an assurance that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life for him, that his place in the family of God is secure, that Jesus is preparing a place for him. I mentioned earlier in, in, the, in the service about Russell Brand being baptised this week. It, it's not for us to, you know, there have been lots of comments, of course, because when you know personalities and celebrities, you'll have opinions about them. But in his own words, Russell Brand said that he had surrendered to Christ. And that's what happens when we realise that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, is we say, I am giving myself to you because... I'm going to trust in your way for me now. And so I wonder what that means for you. Where, where do you stand with Jesus today? What do you believe about him? And what have you done with the things that he said that we are to do in response to him? Have we turned from our sin? Have we put our faith in him? Have we believed that he is what we ultimately need and that he is the way for our future as well as our present? People have all sorts of motivations for living. All sorts of ideas about what is going to fulfill life and what is essentially our saviour of life, for life. Um, I want to share, and it's, it's a longish quote from Steve Jobs, and it's, it has been doing the rounds on social media over the last couple of years, so I'm sure a number of you will have seen it or, or read it, but I want to read it because it's really, really interesting. Steve Jobs, the, uh, the founder of co-founder of, of Apple and the inventor of the iPhone. Um, so influential um, in our, our modern tech age. Died in 2011. But this is what he said, amongst other things, just before he died in 2011. I'm going to read it to you. He said this. He says, I have reached the pinnacle of success in business. In other people's, li in other people's eyes, my, li my life is a success. However, aside from work, I've had little joy. At the end of the day, wealth is just a fact I've gotten used to. Right now, lying in my hospital bed, reminiscing all my life, 
I realized that all the recognition and wealth I took so much pride in has faded and become meaningless in the, in the face of imminent death. You can hire someone to drive your car or make money for you, but you cannot hire someone to stand sick and die for you. Material things lost can be found again, but there is one thing that can never be found when it is lost, life. Whatever stage of life we are currently at, in time we will face the day that the curtain closes. Love your family, spouse, children and friends. Treat them right. As we get older and wiser, we slowly realize that wearing a $300 or a $30 watch both give the same time. Whether we have a $300 or a $30 wallet or purse, both carry the same amount. Whether we drive a $150,000 or $30,000 car, the road and the distance are the same and we reach the same destination. Whether we drink a $1,000 or a $10 bottle of wine, the hangover is the same. Whether the house we live in is 100 or 1,000 square foot, the loneliness is the same you will realize that your true inner happiness does not come from the material things of this world. Whether you travel first class or economy class, if the, pra the plane crashes, you go down with it. Therefore, I hope you realize that when you have friends, brothers and sisters with whom you discuss, laugh, sing, talk about north, south, east or heaven and earth, this is real happiness. An indisputable fact of life, don't raise your children to be rich, Educate them to be happy. When they grow up, they will realize or they will know the value of things, not the price. Fascinating, isn't it, to hear someone like that talk about what, is, or what they realize is a value in life. Look, look all of, most of us, all of us, perhaps at certain times of our lives, have been lured by this false promise that money will be the answer to almost all of our problems. But actually, in our logical moments, we realize that money cannot solve it. We actually denounce that as a lie. And we know that our relationships in life are far, far more valuable. But even our human relationships have their limits. I was walking along last week along the seafront of Leon Solent. And I don't know whether you do, if, if you've got time on your hands and you're having a slow walk and you look at the little plaques on the benches, the little uh, memories or, or messages to, almost from that person to us. And here's one that struck me as I was walking along. This was a, a message almost to the person that had died and it said this from, from a friend or a family member. If love alone could have saved you, you would have lived forever. Meant to be a comforting idea that love from a family goes a long way, but it was almost a tragic thing to say that even the love from family and friends could not save that life. But here is an unbeknown, probable unbeknown truth to the person that wrote that plaque. Love can enable us to live forever. If only we find the one who loves us and has the power to save us for eternity. The Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but has eternal life. Heaven, the future, eternity is yours because of the love of God shown through Jesus Christ. That's the truth. Money? No. Love of family and friends? Great. But the love of God is what grants us eternity. The Bible has all sorts of different ways of describing heaven and how it will come about. <laughs> On the one hand, Peter talks about, in the New Testament, in one of his letters, talks about the world being destroyed and a new, a new earth being created. Paul, on the other hand, in Romans, talks about the world being restored and renewed back to its original sense of, of, of perfection and uh, the, the bottom line is that there'll be a recreation of the good world the good creation that god had made without the damaging effects of sin and death that have infected it jesus of course in uh, john 14 that we've just read talked with his disciples about preparing a place coming back and taking us to be with him 
But then there's this other picture in Revelation 21. John is given a, a wonderful vision of not being taken to heaven, but of heaven coming to us. And I want to read that because it's rich in imagery and of meaning. In Revelation 21, John says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a, br a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. A number of years ago, Belinda Carlisle wrote that song, Heaven is a place on earth. But the thing is, human beings in some ways have been trying to create heaven on earth, but they can't manage it. Heaven cannot be created by a political system because people mess it up. We can't save each other. Heaven cannot be created by lovers' affections. I think that's probably what Belinda Carlisle was singing about. The perfect love that we find can, can make heaven for us. It can't not from another human being. But heaven is a place created by the God who made us, who saved us, who loves us more than anything. And he wants us to be close to him. It was Jesus' desire for us to be where he is, in the house of the Father, where our rejoicing and delight will be in him. When David prayed in the Psalms, he said, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. If you want heaven, but you don't want God, then you don't want heaven. Because <laughs> the greatest thing of heaven is being close to and seeing God face to face. And all of your deep longings, deep down in your heart, the things that this world cannot satisfy that, that C.S. Lewis talked about, the world that we were made for is a world where God is at the heart of it because we know him as the lover of our souls. When God makes perfect everything spoiled by sin and renews our experience of life, there are some things that we'll never say in heaven what are some of those things that we're never, ever going to say when we're with him? Good things always come to an end. <laughs> well, they won't. <laughs> they won't, because you'll be in perfection, and it will never end. And don't, get, don't, 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 get, don't try and get your head around that too much this morning and get boggled by it, yeah? Don't let that put you off either, because actually we don't want the good things to come to an end. What else will we not say in heaven? I'm only human. We say that, of course, when we talk about our limitations. Oh, don't expect too much of me. I'm going to mess it up. I'm a, do you know what? You're going to be the perfect human. You're going to be restored and perfected and see Jesus face to face and he's going to make you like him and you're never going to sin again. When you say, I'm only human, you're going to say, I am, the, I am human in my perfected state. Never going to have to apologize for your sin ever. I'm feeling under the weather today. I mean, no sickness there. There's people that we wish could be here today that are not very well. They're never going to be outside of each other's presence because you're never going to feel under the weather. Sickness and death are gone. You're already reading ahead with my little notes, aren't you? Don't forget to lock the door. <laughs> when was the last time you had to say that to someone? Don't forget to lock the door. Oh, did I forget to lock the door? Never going to have to worry about being burgled. Never going to have to worry about someone nipping in and taking something of yours. You no know, locks in heaven, isn't there? Nothing, nothing that's going to be, uh, you know, a threat to us, is there? Security. I can't afford that. To save up. It's a good discipline to save up, isn't it? Good to anticipate things that we need to 
um, appreciate that God says, come, come and eat, come and eat, come and enjoy, no cost, no price, all the blessings are yours. Hey, come and talk to me afterwards about other things we won't say in heaven. I've got a few more on the list here, loads of them. But here's the key thing for us. In keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. God is there. Everything will be right because we will be right with God. So we've had this question over the last few weeks. Where is Jesus now? And in your doubting moments, in your weak moments, and you think, has God left me? What's he doing? Am I alone? Remember this. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. His salvation work for you is complete. His death and his resurrection means that if you put your trust in him, you're saved. Nothing can take it away. Jesus rules. He's doing good for you and for the church, for his bride. Jesus is with us by his spirit. He promised to be with us right to the end of the age, and he is because he he doesn't need to divide his attention. His spirit is everywhere, all the time. Wherever you go in the world, Jesus will never leave you. He's working in your life to transform you and to make you more like him. Jesus is praying to us. He's interceding to the Father. He's saying to the Father, all the good things that God might do in your life, he's praying for you and for us as his church. And he's preparing a place in heaven for us. He's getting our room ready and it will be the best room and experience. He's longing for the day where we will be with him. So lay up your treasures in heaven because we have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are not a God who sits and leaves us to life on our own. We thank you, Jesus, that these things that we've been contemplating over these last few weeks are mind-blowing. Help us to spend more time thanking you and praising you and reflecting and trusting and anticipating that our faith is active even as we give our lives over to you and say, Lord Jesus, life isn't about me, it's about you, but I'm, I'm participating in the life of faith because a life lived with you is the best, it's worth it. It's the only thing that will ever fulfill us. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing us today and doing good. And we just want to lift you up and say thank you. In your name, amen.